one. All right, we are live. We are live. We are live. And uh, I am excited again about uh, coming back again. What is this, two days in a row? And uh, But again, so excited uh, to have with me uh, my good friend, dear brother, and a fellow apologist, uh, Alex McElroy, uh, from Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. Uh, Urban Logia and Relentless are teaming up tonight for a very special uh, segment of Ask the Pastor. And, uh, and so, hey, listen, you've got questions and we've got answers. And uh, we, <laughs> yeah, we hope. <laughs> and so listen, um, hit the share button, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, but uh, let everybody know that we are on, especially uh, those folks that are out there in uh, Facebook. Let's see, we got Shoddy Mills. Uh, Rick, I see you. Uh, CP, Tyler. Uh, Shanelise, blessings to you. And uh, we appreciate all of you who are on. Denton Carter, uh, Teresa, blessings, blessings. And uh, keep coming on in. Wonderful. V, I see you. I see you. I see you. Uh, let somebody know. Invite them. Let them know that we are here. Uh, thanks, Christine, for joining. Uh, Prime Minister 66, blessings to you. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, come on in the room. Come on in the room. And uh, we are. Um, all right. I see you. I see you. I see you. Yvonne, blessings to you. Uh, Nadine, wonderful. Jumping in. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. And uh, so we're excited tonight about uh, this uh, conversation and um, uh, doing things just a little different tonight, coming with a different segment. And uh, but I'm glad because this is one of the uh, uh, very rarely do I have a uh, a guest on. I got to start doing that a little bit more. And and uh, but I'm glad to have my brother on uh, sharing the platform with me. And uh, check out the video that we did. Uh, what was it last month? Um, uh, tell them about it, Alex. Yeah, let me try to find it too. Um, so it, there was a. Um another pastor actually sent me a a clip of a, a gentleman a young guy who said he's formerly christian now he's a, he's a muslim and um he he went through all his reasonings and, and things of that nature i'm trying to find it right now that's right that's um, right and you know we were very gracious because we didn't we it was a sensitive uh issue i mean this wasn't somebody trying to blast the church so he seemed a bit confused. But what we did for an hour, hour and a half, hour long was is just very, very clearly debunk not him, but the thing, the propositions he's putting forth and how they're they're not consistent. Um, once again, I don't blame this young man. He just he hasn't done all the research. And so we tried to do that for him and for others. And but um maybe we'll get into some of that tonight if you'll have questions. But this guy can tell you more than I can, but Islam is 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 simply inconsistent. It's in it is, it is fatalistically inconsistent. In other words, there's no way that the totality of, if you want to take the Quran from beginning to end, it can't be true if it's true, it's false. <laughs> so that's Absolutely. a problem. Absolutely. And there is uh, uh, Pastor Alex's channel, uh, Relentless Pursuit of uh, Purpose. Uh, definitely go over there and subscribe if you have not already uh, subscribed. One of the things that I love about this community of uh, Christian apologists is that we support each other and uh, we uh, we are frequently um, from time to time guest on each other's uh, platforms and uh, we're, we're constantly um, giving that extra push and that high five uh, to the work uh, that's going on in uh, respectively uh, in uh, in each corner of this of these uh, these theological streets <laughs> and uh, I appreciate my dear brother and the work that he's doing. Uh, definitely um, go ahead and like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell uh, on uh, Alex's page as well. And let's support our dear brother. Uh, here's that video that we were we uh, collaborated on uh, debunking Islam. And uh, and so if you've had friends or family or people uh, asking questions, this this video is going to be a really good 
uh, resource for kind of understanding some of the problems with Islam, why it's not, uh, it, you know, the God of Islam and the God of the Bible are not the same God and how Islam is not a pathway uh, for salvation. And, you know, we, we, we talk about a lot of the problems with Islam, with the Quran, and uh, if you know people who are Muslims, and if you just want to educate yourself on it, definitely slide over there. There's the link uh, to that video. Uh, Teresa, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you uh, so kindly. Uh, we really appreciate your support. Uh, let's see. Uh, and thank you also for um, the super chat. Uh, Prime Minister 66 as well. We really appreciate that. And uh, so let's go ahead. I see my my good friend, Pastor Booker, uh, is on. And uh, so many of you are jumping in. Uh, it's going to continue to, um, uh, to grow in terms of uh, people jumping on. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead. What I'll do is try to... Um, field the questions from the uh, comment section. Make sure you put question in front of your questions and uh, and let's just kind of set up some, 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 some rules around it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, say, let's, let's do the best that we can to stay away from um, dividing. Uh, I, I call it kind of like battleground kind of questions yeah. where it just kind of the answer is you're either on this side or that side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just, there's a time and place for those questions. Mm -hmm. This probably is not the best format. I, I would prefer a more controlled Bible study environment yeah. where, you know, we can gauge the audience and ah, Sister Johnson, you look kind of puzzled <laughs> there. Like I can't see you. So I don't know what you walk away thinking. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, if, if, if the answer puts us on one side or the other and it kind of creates that battleground, mm -hmm. that fault line, if you will. And eh, that's probably not the best kind of question to ask on this segment. And then also, if the question is going to involve uh, unpacking, too much unpacking and really kind of, you know, there's so many layers to it, we probably won't be able to get started on it because we'd almost have to do an entire segment on that, right? So it's got to be a question we can we can kind of get right to give you a, 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 a you know a very thorough, concise, and quick answer to mm -hmm. uh, without spending a whole lot of time having to unpack so much. So we just kind of want to give you know just you know lay some groundwork and some rules around uh, asking these questions. Uh, but again, please put question in front of your question, and uh, there we go. Please refrain from the battleground kind of questions. And I saw so one earlier, I don't know if we if it's still up there. Add something. Okay, here we go. And oh. uh and so since uh Alex, Pastor Alex is my guest, I'm going to let you uh have first dibs at this question. And uh, thanks Ed for asking. Yeah, I don't know if I'm the best on this, but what I will say um well, first of all, I appreciate the question. I'm glad you're thinking about this because um music has increasingly been abused and become abusive because of because of the fact that it's theologically uh, void really some not all of it but you but you know who I'm talking about and if you actually go back on my channel I did a show with a panel and we were talking about millennials and mysticism and you know, don't sleep on millennials, y'all. They they're aware more than than what you think, and actually, they're thinking a lot more than what you say. And a lot of my apologetics is directed towards youth and young adults, as a former youth pastor and everything. That's just that's my heart. Um, now, one of my guests, uh, Ed, was KJ Scriven, who is a worship leader and a, and a, and a worship artist, and he actually is the worship leader at Transformation Church out in North Carolina, where one of the main people who trained me. And apologetics actually attends that church named Frank Turek. Um, so if he's there, I'm sure that KJ's music is theologically sound. But actually, I've, I've heard him speak and sing. Actually, I've even heard him the way I met him. We were at a conference together in North Carolina and I was about to speak and he was closing his session. I was like, who is this guy? Because he wasn't talking like a worship leader. He was talking like an apologist almost. And I, 
now I can understand how that influences his music. So go check out KJ Scriven. Um, I think he just had a new a new song or a new album come out actually. So that's one that I can recommend. I don't really know too much in the music world, um, but I do understand your your uh, growing tired of of Hillsong and and, and some <laughs> like that. <laughs> we'll, we'll say it like that's that. Tough, you know, that's a tough question because it would really involve um, uh, essentially providing um, you know a um, a list of you know, artists and this, that, and the other. And it, it, what comes along with that is endorsement and all kinds of things. And it's really difficult to to do that. But, um, um, you know, there's a lot of articles that have also been written on this subject as well with people who share uh, your concern. And um, um, I, I, I will tell you this, um, Hart Ramsey puts out some real good uh, music and uh, and one of the reasons I know that is because a good friend of mine, Greg Johnson, is the uh, music director uh, uh, there um, at uh, the church that Hart Ramsey uh, pastors. Uh, but he's an incredible uh, Ramsey is incredible musician in his own right. But Greg uh, is very theologically sound mm -hmm. and uh, and and you know theologically astute. Uh, so a lot of the music that they're putting out, uh, you know, again, is going to give you uh, that contemporary feel, yet it's going to be rich, uh, theologically rich, biblically sound, so forth and so on. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, definitely look it up and look for other articles that share that concern <clears throat> and check out what resources, uh, artists, so forth and so on, they might uh, recommend. And uh, but that's a that's a great question. Uh, let's see. Um, thanks, Ed, for asking that question. Let's go to the next question here. Uh, Richard D is asking, have either of you had an opportunity to witness to a devout uh, Judaism person of faith? So, so in other words, a devout Jew, uh, somebody who is uh, I have. Uh, how about you, Alex? I have not. Personally, um, what was the guy? I think there was a guy we did a thing on witnessing how to witness to um, friends and family. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy actually literally wrote the book on that. But then there was another guy, KJ, a different KJ, um, who uh, he's he does he works with CS Lewis Institute. And so we kind of unpack that because I, if I'm not mistaken, the other guy was Jewish. So I haven't personally, but that that's a reference I have for you if you need it. Gotcha. Good. Yeah. I, uh, and I think I, uh, I mentioned this, um, on a, uh, I was looking for it. I mentioned this on a live. This might've been sometime last month, but I talked about, um, a young Jewish man that was part of, uh, the Hasidic Jewish sect uh, in, uh, in New York. And, uh, when I was, um, uh, when I was living in New York at the time, uh, we got into a real good conversation, uh, about Judaism and Christianity, uh, and, um, talking about, uh, the Messiah, the new Testament, uh, and, uh, some of his concerns, questions, this, that, or the other, and, um, exploring Judaism as a backdrop and a cultural, uh, uh, basin for understanding the Bible has always been for me uh, of great interest and a passion. And, uh, and uh, you know, I spent a couple of years actually at a Jewish yeshiva and uh, uh, attempting to learn um, scripture from a uh, Hebraic perspective. And, uh, and so that was very helpful to bring into the conversation. Uh, he was very impressed with um, my knowledge of his, his own faith and culture knowledge of the Bible and, uh, and, and the ability to, um, to, to explain some things, uh, to him that ultimately led to having a conversation with him about the gospel. Right. And, uh, and so, um, I mean, that goes right into this course that we're about to drop on urban Logia. It's going to be the gospels against its Jewish background. Mm -hmm. And so it's really the, the goal is going to be able to help people to read the gospels, uh, in its Jewishness in its Jewishness yeah. uh, uh, and um, to be able to hear it in the same way that the earliest readers would have heard it and to be able to recognize uh, the rich 
uh, Jewish motifs and themes and uh, cultural um, uh, cultural nuances and uh, just a rich uh, cultural tapestry in terms of the way that the gospels are presented that many Jewish people, because they never read the New Testament, don't even recognize. But when you start pointing that out, it because it, it, and, and what we're doing, we're not recontextualizing the New Testament as Jewish. It was already the, it's already Jewish. The new uh, the gospels were contextualized for Gentile audiences. Mm. How about that? for a uh, for a uh, plot twist, right? Mm -hmm. So it was really contextualized for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but but to be able to understand it in its original cultural context can really help you evangelistically to yes. be able to share the gospel uh, with Jewish people who do need to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that they might be saved. Uh, great question again, Rashad, man. We really, really appreciate that. Anything else you want to add on that? Yeah, you said, uh, well, you said a lot of good things, but uh, two things I want to come back to, and this is more of a broad um, realization that, that I think everybody can take away and, and can help them. And I've done actually part of the thing, I did some, some stuff with the CSO Institute and I did uh, another live or Facebook live at one point, but it was about conversational apologetics and basically you know how do you enter into those conversations now if you're familiar with uh greg coco's tactics um his book tactics you know he walks you through these certain questions it's not tricks or tactics but it's just asking the right questions and so what I, what I think pastor damon was um if you heard it like one of the really cool pieces of um you know methodology that we need to have is asking better questions. I know as apologists, we always want to have the answers is you need to have the answers too, but <laughs> as much as possible, but the, a lot of time asking the right questions opens up people to their own assumptions. It opens up the conversation. It makes it an amicable conversation. Some of the best conversations I've had have been with Sikhs, uh, Imams, Hindu priests, like people who are very firm in what they, you know, who some of the most difficult conversations I've had, <laughs> <laughs> other Christians, <laughs> other Christians, and on some of those issues that Damon said we're not going to get into tonight, and and so I just think that it's telling when I can enter in, especially if I do my research as Damon, Pastor Damon was saying, and and learn something about their culture. When I remember talking with these two uh, Muslim kids at at a university campus, and we just walked up on them. I was working with a, a, a campus ministry, and for the first. 15, 20 minutes, I'm just like, tell me about Islam. Tell me about what's, tell me where you are. Tell me what you think. I'm not going to assume anything. And I think sometimes as Christians, you, we, you know, out of a good place, we want to win them for, for the kingdom, but there's a, there's a way to go about it. And um, we don't want to jump the gun. So. Right. Uh, Alex, if you can uh, also type in uh, some of those resources that you're, you're mentioning, uh, man, that sounds real good. And I think that could uh, really, uh, further equip uh, some of our uh, listeners in terms of um, knowing what you've read and and how you've come to some of those uh, conclusions as well. But uh, yeah, if you can just kind of type that in, um, okay. in the comment section. And, and uh, I'd love to get, get my hands on some of those resources as well. Man, I got to figure out what it was now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the next question here. All right. Uh, well, here's one of them. Let's let me do this real quick. Uh, that's one of them. You talked about KJ Scriven uh, and and a particular video though. This is one of the resources there. And uh, let's go to uh, this question here. Uh, hang in there. We'll get we'll get to your question uh, for sure. And if we don't see it, uh, ask it again because we 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 may um, uh, miss um this question that you've asked. Um, how do we approach a very active dream life as Christians? Could that be indication of a special gifting? Uh, what do you want to do? You want you want to you want to jump on first, or what do you want to do? So yeah, it just gets a little uh, out there sometimes. Um, is it possible for this to be a gift? Possibly, I, I, and I'm being careful on purpose because this is this gets it can veer into that mysticism lane, and 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 it can also veer into spiritual abuse. And I'll tell how when 
when it's not that you're doing this, by the way, uh, Shang Lee's when somebody, especially somebody with some position of authority in church, and I've seen this happen, claims to have a certain gift, either a prophetic gift or some kind of dream gift or whatever that is, they can make people feel um, beholden to them for their personal revelation. Exactly. And that's dangerous. Now, here's my general rule, two general rules. Number one, and my, my pastor used to say this, uh, once somebody says, God told me, if you come to me for advice and then you say, well, God told me, I'm done. I'm done. And we'll see if he told you or not. Deuteronomy 18 is very clear on how to know a, a false prophet from a real prophet. So I don't, I'm not going to fight God if he did tell you, and I'm not going to fight with you if you think he did. However, if we look at dreams, especially in the Bible, they didn't happen on an every night basis or even, you know, Joseph is the one we always think about, right? He, we have record of, was it three dreams? And I'm not saying that's all he had. I'm just saying that if it's a, if it's a dream of that significance, it's not going to happen all the time. God doesn't do miracles all the time. Miracles are for specific purposes. And sometimes we get caught up in the miracle and we miss the point of the miracle. So that's something that I that I use as kind of a marker for for what, why why would I even have this dream? I don't I don't dream. So if I have a dream and remember it, it's a, it's for a reason. My wife remembers her dreams. My kids do. I don't ever remember my dreams. So if I happen to remember one, there's probably a reason. That would be a good signifier for me personally. But this is the other part. Whatever is true for you may not in this area at least may not be true for every Christian. And so I don't want to make something prescriptive that God is, is simply working out with you. Um, and I know that's a bit vague, but but I don't want to overshadow or take the place of the Holy Spirit. And I've seen this happen and I'm saying this as, now, I'm not apologist Alex, I'm, a, I'm Pastor Alex right now. I'm saying this as I've seen the abuse and I've seen this thing go sideways numerous times, whether it's prophecy or dreams or, you know, the list goes on. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, man, that's uh that's some real good um advice, uh pastoral type advice as well. And uh, I I uh I, I'm not even gonna add to that because uh you know my thoughts uh were basically the same. Mm -hmm. And um gotta be careful. I, I have a very active dream life because I have a very active mind. Uh but uh, I also realize that while I may dream vi very vividly and remember a lot of my dreams, um Dreams are a essentially a metaphysical phenomenon. Um, they they happen because God has designed our mind to be able to uh, compress things that we've seen and things that we've thought about together, uh, compress it all together, and play out in this phenomenon that we call dreaming, which in reality nobody can really even define because you can't. Dreams are not tangible. Right. You can't. They're not shareable. I can't say, hey, watch this dream with me that I had last night. Let's watch it together tonight. I can't do that. So mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's uh and even when they recur, it is just part of a natural phenomenon that we experience. Could God work through that? Sure, we've seen that in scripture. But if he did, as Pastor Alex pointed out, it would most certainly be non-normative. Mm -hmm. Uh it, 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 it's 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 not it's it's not going to be something that that's the that's the normal way that God communicates. The normal way that God communicates is through His Word, mm -hmm. and uh, and and when people start saying God spoke to me, um, what's dangerous about that is if you say God said, you are literally placing what you said God said on the level of divine inspiration with the biblical canon. You know, I don't know if we can. Uh, are you prepared to say that what he told you is as authoritative as what is written in scripture? If you are not, then you probably want to put some salt on that and uh, <laughs> be very careful about, you see what I mean? So yeah. uh, that's a great question, Shanelise. Thank you. Let me um, share this too, just because yeah. you brought it up. So y'all stay tuned. If you do subscribe to my channel, I'm actually in the process of finalizing a video on the canon um, as we speak. Uh, so it'll come out next week at some point, probably Tuesday. And it's not going to be a course, but it's going to be a good, you know, 16, 20 minutes. And it's going to give you the basics of how to understand 
the canon, how it came to be, and how it is authoritative, and how they how everyone believed that way before Constantine, right? So we're gonna bust some myths too, but um, just wanted to let you know that's coming up. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's <laughs> my kind of stuff right there. Your story and canon and oh, yeah. that's some good stuff. Yes, indeed. Good. Let's see what else we got. Um, oh, somebody was mentioning uh, some good music. Sovereign Grace music is really good. I just wanted to put that up there. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, here's a question by Yvonne Thomas. I know some folk in the Tampa area, um, the Tampa Bay area. Uh, but they might be a little too far. When you mentioned Brandon, uh, you'd have to kind of cross the, uh, 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 the not the Gandhi, uh, the uh, Howard Franklin, and go over into Pinellas County. I do know a church uh, uh, there. Um, I could, I'll get with you. I'll, I'll uh, inbox you that information. The pastor is actually my oldest nephew, I discipled him and they actually just planted, they spent about a year um, launching online and, and they just uh, did, uh, they've just started within the last month or two uh, their live services. So they're still doing, they're doing both, uh, but they spent about a year doing a, a online launch, a soft launch and, uh, and they're doing, uh, they're doing really, really well. And uh, so I, yeah. That's in that area it might be a little bit of a drive, though. Uh, I don't know any in the Brandon area particularly, uh, but if I uh, do come across some churches a little closer, uh, I'll definitely um, let you know. And uh, good question. Good question. And uh, my brother BK was mm -hmm. good. The fat Joe of apologetics. <laughs> my brother. And uh, good, good brother. Good brother. And as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, here's a question. Uh, when is the appropriate time to leave a church? Mm. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right. So, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you can go first. <laughs> all right. All right. So I, I think, uh, for one, I'd like to see a little bit more context around the question uh, because... Um, Automatically, I mean, people do leave churches, and uh, but it, it's like you know, what's the context uh, behind the leaving, though? What are the circumstances, right? right? You know, um, sometimes people move, sometimes they move on because uh, the the needs in their family uh, changes, and they need a church uh, that might uh, be better suited for their family dynamic. Right. You know, they've got teenagers now instead of little children. And there might be a, a ministry that's really, really good for, uh, you know, ministering. To, I don't know. There are different reasons that people do legitimate reasons right. leave church. Uh, but then there's the there's the um, kind of the illegitimate reasons. Right. You know, um, you um, you see a pastor, you like the way uh, he preaches. And I'm just going to go follow them because I just. I just, you, you become attracted to this person's persona, this person's charisma. Um, I, I wouldn't do that. That's, 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 that's really kind of setting, lead you to constantly doing that, looking for the next best thing. It, it can become a pattern in your life where you can't find, you can't be settled because what you're really looking for is sensationalism. Yeah. You know, um, uh, so I don't know if it's really about the appropriate time as much as uh, the appropriate reasons to leave churches. Right. What are, what are, what are some of the appropriate reasons to do it? Uh, to, to, uh, you know, timing, not so much so, but I think we need to look at what are some of, you know, what are some of the some of the right reasons uh, that may necessitate or warrant actually leaving a church. And those reasons may not necessarily be bad. Doesn't mean that the church did anything wrong or you got anything. Um, but, you know, don't just, you know, don't just leave and disappear and, you know, don't say anything to anybody. You just, next thing you know, you're over here somewhere or whatever. Um, you know, one thing about pastors 
is that they do not only invest spiritually, but they just invest energy and time and love. And uh, remember when John said, no greater joy have I than the than to learn that my children are walking in the truth. Well, those those believers afforded John the opportunity to see their spiritual development and growth. What if they had just jetted on them? Didn't mm -hmm. say nothing, didn't look back. Well, he wouldn't know. He wouldn't even have, he wouldn't be blessed enough to even see their development in their walk in Christ. And sometimes folk are so quick to just leave a place that they just rob these elders and these pastors who have spent time laboring and love to see you grow, just rob, just rob them of the blessing of being able to witness that by just jetting up and going somewhere simply because um, you, you, you just became fascinated with something over there. And it's kind of looking always for the greener grass kind of a deal. But again, I do get it. There are legit reasons for leaving churches. I think it, you know, again, the question uh, I think is more better formatted to appropriate reasons more so than the appropriate time yeah yeah you um we might act actually have to do a whole session on this question yeah. because yeah yeah um it is tough and, and and when my pastor used to always say he said uh you came in through the front door don't leave through the back door kind of to your point that like we built something here together you were a part of it whatever the reason is you know, let's part amicably because we're going to see each other in heaven type of thing. So I'll tell you this. I was at a church for 13 years. I, I grew to become the pastor of education and I was never seeking anything. I, I like I probably ran from it, to be honest with you. But my friend and I, another pastor there, we left to start a house church. There was no animosity. There was no rift. There was no fallout. Um we squashed rumors before rumors started. We were sent out the right way, blessed out the right. So, so we left to do something different that we felt God was calling us to do. And everyone understood that. So once again, to Damon's point, it's not about the leaving. It's about why are you leaving? Now, to, their, to your other point, I won't name this church. I know, I should probably shouldn't even say the city. I know a church, um, that y'all probably, if I, if I, y'all know who this pastor is and Pete, I know of a lady who literally packed up everything from uh, maybe New York, somewhere way, way far away from where this particular place was and came because of this guy, because of his charisma. And she, she felt that she was going to get um, some sort of special anointing if she could just get there. And she put drug all her kids and, and then ended up, almost homeless a few months late. like you got to have some discernment you got to have some some wisdom about this and paul very quickly squashed this type of stuff and you know wow. y'all are saying apollos y'all are saying stop i ain't nobody's jesus he's he, i mean i'm paraphrasing but that's the that's the impetus to it yeah. we, had, we were having a call last night we do this wednesday night thing we're going through a book together and we kind of talked about this a little bit that especially because it's a house church, we want to know who you are, especially since we are inviting you into our home. And so the dynamic's a little different, but also we're, we're, we're not cliche saying this, we're actually building a family. And so, you know, it's, the different congregations are different, but whatever, I would say this too, if you have an issue with the pastor, Hopefully you've built enough of a relationship where you can go and say that respectfully and say, you know what? I just think this has run its course. I love you. And, and you can part that way, but don't, I've seen this too, where you leave, then you blast them on Facebook and then, uh, you know, try to convince other people to leave. That's, that's, that's the wrong way to go about it. So yeah. we got to, here's, here's the other reality. There's something, and we're talking about this, that there's some things we say today, the church says today, that Peter and Paul would have no understanding of. And I mean simple things, not even bad things. And even saying, are you coming to church on Sunday? They'd have no idea what you meant. Because the church was a group of people. It is a group of people. And so the other part I want to be careful of is when people are thinking, well, I'm going to leave this church. What is it that you're leaving? Are you just leaving that local body, that congregation, that building? 
because there's there's this other way that's leaving the church like i'm spiritual but i just don't want to go to be a part of a group anymore that is not biblical so right. if this ain't your group, this particular church location, okay, but you, you're you still a part of the body if you consider yourself a Christian. I know you did something on this recently, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And so we got to talk about that too, because this 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 wave of people that, especially younger people, like, I just, I'm done with church. You know, they want to claim church or usually it ain't even church or it's just, I want to do my own thing, but that's not how the body of Christ works. That's not how a body works. Matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, not how a body works. That I think that's a, that's a real. I think that's really demonic. This this um, wave of I'm leaving the church kind of a thing. It, it's just becoming so popular. Uh, I, I see it as demonic. Uh, I, I tell you what, right in that same vein of uh, of people leaving churches or, or church congregations and going somewhere else. Uh, there's certain things we've got to be careful of as well. I think one of them is um, this whole notion of, um, well, you know, I'm waiting on my pastor to release me. You know, that almost starts bordering on the cultic right there. You know, release you for what? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Release you. You know, you know what I mean? And uh, it, it it starts getting into this. I I need permission from a pastor to make everyday adult decisions that God's given me a brain and a mind to make that, that I don't, I don't, I don't uh, fork over or, or yield my own decision-making abilities to somebody else. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's so we, we've got to be careful of there, 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 there are two sides of this thing that can become really, ex, that can become extreme. And we want to uh, be careful about that. And, and, and this kind of borders on some of what we're talking about. Um, but, you know, my feeling on that is, is that, you know, that's not, that's not our domain. We definitely shouldn't be telling uh, congregational members uh, who to vote for. I agree. Doesn't mean that we won't mention uh, things going on in the political arena, uh, you know, and how they affect our lives. But to, uh, you know, once you start doing that, it starts getting into kind of like your Christian nationalism kind of kind of thing there. You know what I mean? It's literally that. I mean, you if you can only come to this church, if you vote this way, then you, that's all you're going to have in that church. Like, yeah. what else? You, <laughs> that's all you're going to have. <laughs> we we have a we have a house church. It's maybe 20 people. And even within that, we don't all see eye to eye politically. And we're still brothers and sisters. We still eat together, sharing the word together because we know where the line is. And that's not going to ever be a dividing line for me. Just like you mentioned, starting off some of these there's. So I had a long discussion with a pastor yesterday, not contentious. It's just if I brought it on here, it would be. <laughs> but it, it was it was on a good it's, it's stuff like I like talking about it. You know, you, Damon, you would love talking about it. But it, some some Christian conversations, especially at a certain level, are closed door conversations. Right. This is not a if it's going to distract from people hearing, receiving or walking in the gospel. That's that's the litmus test for me. One on one. If somebody can handle it, let's talk about it. We can talk about it. But to, to say it from a stage. Right. Right. My pastor used to say. Your pe people, so many people died for you to have the right to vote. He said, you have to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, though, but you have to vote because yeah. of the, the So that's kind of, you know, I, I'll leave it there. Now, how would you tackle this right here? Um, Frank D. Blunt Jr. is asking this question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. Um, okay. So I was actually doing marriage counseling yesterday for a couple. It was husband and wife together, and it's also over Zoom. Um, it gets tricky. So the way, and I come, I come from a large church, about fifteen thousand. So when there was counseling sessions, um, we try to obviously get husband and wife, but there was always a, a male and female pastor. Not necessarily that they were married, but they were a male and female pastor doing the counseling together. So, so even if it was one of the uh, well, no, if it was just a guy, it would probably just be just the man pastor. 
this is especially in light of 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 recent things i would never do this i don't know if i can make it prescriptive but i think i think there's good reason to when you have that title whatever people think of it that title of pastor people give you that certain level of it's just like you go to your doctor and your doctor tells you this is this and this and you're like i guess that's what it is then people treat pat and they should treat pastors like that but the problem is we've seen spiritual abuse we've seen physical sexual abuse so um i know one of the rule i've heard is if 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 i'm if a pastor a male pastor is meeting with a female congregant of any kind keep the office door open that you know just tell people that you know tell the person you're meeting with the door has to stay open it's for my safety and for yours um you know i don't know if, if let me let me just interject there uh because sometimes and i'm glad you said it in that way hmm. for 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 my protection and for yours hmm. because a lot of times this is you know this is the way the world hears this it almost sounds like when we when we talk about that uh, they call it the Billy Graham rule. Right. It almost sounds like what we're really just trying to do is make sure that we protect men from women. Because, you know, women, are dem they're demons. They'll get you trapped up. They'll get you all. And it almost sounds like the rule is for men to be protected from women, lest Satan should use them. The reality is, is, is that these kind of, uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, of, uh, Things are put in place for everybody's protection, not just to protect a man from, you know, those, those, you know, because women have this tendency to listen to Satan. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let the devil use them in the red dress and the red Prada shoes and all this other stuff. The devil in the red dress, you know, and all this other stuff. It almost sounds like let's yeah. put these rules in place so that we can protect ourselves from the, from the, uh, uh, you know, from the the wows and the seductive temptations of women <laughs> it almost makes women it almost sounds like we're painting women in an evil way the reality is is that it's about everybody being protected not men being protected from women or just women being protected from men but everybody being protected yes. so that uh if anything is said, you know, there we I, go. And I just wanted to throw that out. There. Yeah. No, and that's that's the key. And I hope, ladies, I hope you're not hearing me say that I am not a chauvinist. Right. <laughs> you know, I got a wife and two daughters. Trust me. I, like, I <laughs> um, but here and here to attach the Bible to what you just said, Romans 14, 16 says, Don't even let your good be spoken of as evil. So I want to shun the very appearance. I don't even want to give the give the devil an opportunity to make up a lie it's simply and so that's what i mean is is that i don't plan on doing nothing with her she probably ain't trying to do nothing with me but i don't even want people to get that be able to get that idea in their head because it protects us both and then it actually frees us up to have a better conversation because now we're not having to worry about you know what are they going to like let's let's remove the safeguards now the only other thing i'll say on this question because and and where i gave pause is if the husband's not saved, so sometimes, you know, maybe she goes to church and he's like, I don't, I'm not with that church stuff, but she wants to, you know, save her marriage or whatever the case is, that might be a difficult situation to get him to come to meet with the pastor. Hopefully he will at least do that for his marriage sake. But especially if they both come to the church, no, nah, it should be a husband and wife. I don't, I don't see any reason why it would be one, one and not the other. Yeah, uh, because no counselor, whether they're a pastor or, uh, you know, whether it's um, therapeutic, you know, mental health, whatever, should be trying to take sides. And, and you know, if you're talking to one, inevitably, that person's going to have you uh, seeing things from their side yeah. and they're never going to get the whole, you know, so, so nobody should be talking to one without the other anyway, because... Uh, it will definitely make, you know, for a lopsided presentation of what's going on. Now, this question, Pastor Alex, will, you will love uh, because uh, <laughs> Pastor Alex is actually a house uh, church pastor. And uh, so. Yeah, man. Hey, <laughs> 
Look, I've I've done I've been in in some of every kind of church, and I know Pastor Damon had experiences, you know, being in churches, pastoring different. So you just learn this, and and what I really love. Once again, let me reiterate: we, there was no animosity. This is something we had been thinking about and praying about for years. There was a there was a cohort. There was a planning team a year in advance of even launching. And you might think, well, it's a house church. You don't need that much to launch. No, we we thought it all out. Now, I obviously I love the house church model, and I, and it, and it just if you think of Acts two and how the church started, and and granted it was more out of necessity, but I, I love the idea of that gospel centered community. So on a typical Sunday, well, we haven't really had one. Well, this coming Sunday, we're going to be back in person. It's going to be a little warm out here in Chicago, so we're going to be in the backyard. Uh, but we eat, we worship, and we get in the Word. Now, for us. It is it is me or, or or my friend Pastor Nick. One thing I love about the house church, so there's a lot of things, but one main thing is it is um uh the way we not say preach but teach is 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 pure expository. So what that means is we're going through Romans. So I've been walking us through Romans all Romans four this month, and I'm gonna finish it up on Sunday. But when I say walking through, we did verses one through eight one week, verses nine through 15 one week, and I'll finish the last eight or nine verses. And 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 it takes an hour and a half, but here's what's beautiful. I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna set up the, the scenario, I'm gonna give some background, kind of keep it uh, hermeneutically sound, but then everybody gets to enter in and everybody gets to help, help exegete the text together whether and then none of them are seminary trained and and that's the point no one has a monopoly including me the pastor on the revelation of the day now well that can go sideways too but what what we're there to do is is let everybody see what they see in the text we're there to keep it in line so we don't go out of bounds of, of what the, the actual meaning is but it's such a richness, it's such a beautiful thing. Where I've also been in the other situations where it, that's not bad. I don't, and I don't want it to sound like I'm bashing anything because as long as you're in a healthy, um, gospel centered church, um, do that at whatever kind it is, big, small, and different, or, 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 or medium. But when there's the pastor on the stage and everyone's sitting there listening, there are times, especially if it's a really big church that you could have a question out there and they don't have anywhere to go to ask it. And then they go home at the end of the day and they go throughout the week and then they, they don't have, they don't have that recourse. Now you can build some stuff into your ministry, but I'm simply saying for us, it's automatically built in. Um, the other thing I love about it, no overhead, <laughs> no meetings, um, no bureaucracy. We were going to go serve the homeless last month. Uh, well, we do it. We do it all the time, but, when we do it, I text Nick and say, hey, can we go serve the homeless on Friday? He says, yeah, we put it in a group me, everybody chips in, we go meet. That's it. And and we go, and we're so we're much more agile. We're much more fluid, especially during this time of a pandemic. It's been a it's been a huge blessing because I've seen some of the struggles of, of larger churches and what they have to deal with. And once again, it's not knocking. Them. I'm just saying you got to pay the light bill. They, the electric company don't care that it's a pandemic. Um, the mortgage company don't care. So. These are things that you have to keep up with, regardless of the of the world situation. And so, for us, one of the we, no one saw this pandemic coming. We I'm not saying we were prophetic in this. <laughs> we just it just it just kind of worked out that way for us. But I'm just saying that is uh, some of the things I love. About. Now, how to find one? Uh, if you tell me where you are, I might know. But but. It is, it's a bit harder to find because you're not going to find big church websites and, and things of that nature. A lot of it's word of mouth. So we are, we're growing based on our individual members talking to other people. And, you know, some people, they hear about what we're doing and then, like, yeah, when I, can I come or can I come see what it's like? And they do. And so we're not, we're, we're interested in growing deep, not wide. And right. eventually we will multiply the houses as they did. Um, and so, but we're never going to have a building. We will have multiple houses under an umbrella, but that's just how we're doing it. And, and that's the model we we've aligned with. And, um, to some degree, 
everybody got a house church now <laughs> until they can open up, up again. Um, so I hope that answers your question. If you if you message me directly and tell me where you're at, I might know how to find one near you. But yeah, they are a little bit harder to find because they're not going to have the big awnings or, you know, billboards. Good deal. Good deal. Um, we, and we're moving in on an hour. Uh, let's see. Are there any resources available to help the to help to share the gospel with people hmm. who suffer with uh, mental health? issues sharing the gospel with people who suffer with mental health issues i can't think of anything specifically um geared towards um that demographic specifically and when you say mental health issues that's even uh broad like again you know a person that uh maybe has mental retardation i guess i would imagine it would be much more difficult to share the gospel with them than, uh, for instance, a person that might even be on the autistic spectrum uh, or a person that might have, uh, you know, again, uh, Parkinson's or something like that. Um, that's really interesting. I don't know of any. Do you know of any resources? I don't. And and I, this is, you know, my other thing outside of apologetics, I'm big on purpose. And I always say, um, if something doesn't exist and you're looking for it, it's probably because you're supposed to create it. So maybe that's your thing, Tyler. Maybe you're the one that's gonna that's gonna help us with that because that is a huge. I never yep. would have thought of that. I'll be honest with you. I just I I didn't think of that. And so, um, but I see the need for it for sure because everybody needs to know. So if that's if that's your wheelhouse, I don't know if you deal with people with mental health issues or something. I don't know what you do, but man, that would be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's my friend, Pastor Troy. What up, Troy? Uh, <laughs> oh, man, we appreciate your uh, super chat. And um, he's got a good question there. What are some ways to break the traditional mindset of individualism and get congregants to think communally uh, healthy? Uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll jump in on this. I, you know, I think Pastor Alex uh, talked about some good things. Uh, already uh, that I, I think I can just kind of piggyback on in the early church. The early church was very communal in terms of uh, the way that. So, you know, for instance, when we go to church, quote unquote, on a Sunday, uh, we don't typically think of the Sunday uh, worship service as a um, a learning mm. uh, experience. Uh, and so it's very formal. And uh, certain people speak, certain people don't. Um, well, as long as we continue to have church like that, it's going to be hard to develop more of a communal kind of culture. Whereas when, um, and you can hear it in the New Testament letters, uh, even some of the admonitions mm. uh, came because people, when they came together to worship, uh, the, the service was dialogical. People were, they were in conversation. The teaching was dialogical, right? And and uh, and so um, it invited questions and comments and discussion. And sometimes that went, that went astray. And you can hear Paul even addressing that at a certain point in one congregation. He was like, let's just shut that down. Sisters, ask your husbands at home. Uh, not that he was creating some universal rule, but he was trying to deal with how that kind of thing kind of ran away, kind of a runaway train kind of situation. But but nonetheless, um, we need to be more intentional about learning when we come together, mm. uh, which involves, as Pastor Alex was talking about, that that method and that approach to 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 really allowing conversation around the teaching. Our, our sermons are so formal that they're just essentially lectures in that uh, it's a monologue. It goes one in one direction, whereas sermons in the early New Testament church were not uh, monologues. They were dialogues. Mm. Right. So the person did teach. They did get that information out there. But that information was heard and it was discussed and it was dissected in conversation. Um, we've created essentially a foreign culture 
to the way that we go about doing church that that is antithetical to the communal kind of thing that we would wish to get back to. In order to get back to that, we got to start kind of revisiting and retrieving some of their earlier practices because the communal way of doing things encourage certain behaviors. If we're not doing those behaviors, we're not going to get the communal benefits. Yeah. It, it is, is the point you see. So yeah. that's good. Um, and Troy, I, I think even you and I have talked about this a little bit. I know, you know, uh, you know, theologically um, where I'm going. The to your to your question and to D Pastor Damon's point, there is a there is the east and there's the west. And we've talked a lot about um, I feel like I've been a broken record over the last year and a half of talking about the, the Western individualistic culture and the Eastern collectivist culture and the Bible's written from people living in a collectivist culture to people living in a collectivist culture. And what we've done to Pastor Damon's point is try to superimpose our culture on the text, mm -hmm. but it doesn't fit. And this is where you get the prosperity gospel word of fit. And, and you say, how does that come out of that? Because we've made the I, mm -hmm. I get this, this verse is about me. Let me just, let's burst this bubble real quick. The Bible was not written to you whoever you are. <laughs> I, I did a, a video on hermeneutics. Um, I'll try to pull it up in a second. But basically, you know, a principle of hermeneutics is that we are reading someone else's mail. And there are rules for how to read it. And matter of fact, the very first live I did when this thing started was me and you, uh, Pastor Damon, last year. Remember we did that thing on hermeneutics? That's right. That's right. That's that almost a whole year ago. Um, so we got to understand there's rule. There's, that's the name of the, the video I did about a, two months ago. It's called there's rules to this. You can't just open the Bible and say, well, I think this means for the, that's not how it works. That's not that's just that's not my opinion. That's just not how it works. And that would never fly in any scholarly. I don't care if the scholar is an atheist. That won't fly. There are rules. <laughs> so the reality is, is. If we read the Bible and just actually look at the text and do a little bit of historical research, you don't got to be a, a Hebrew or Greek scholar, but just do a little bit of research on first century Palestine, on ancient Near East culture, you'll see how they would have heard it, the original audience. And so uh, one, one, of the, one of the examples that I give, um, I think it's in the video, and I did a, I did a you know, the What's it? The U version Bible app. I have a I have a hermeneutics plan, a seven day plan you can go through. If you look at Galatians six and nine, what do we do in church? Somebody's having a bad day. Well, don't be weary and well doing. You're going to reap in your season. That's not what it says though. <laughs> the scripture says, "Let us not be weary and well doing. We shall reap if we don't lose heart." There is no way that Paul's audience in Galatia would not have understood the communal aspect. We win. I don't win. We win. That's so good, man. You know what I'm saying? The kingdom is not a you. The kingdom is a group. The kingdom is a is all of us. Yeah. I got a message from my, my brother, Pastor in India today, who I, I, so, I spoke at his conference uh, virtually last year. India's going through it, y'all. I don't know if you see the news, so pray for them. And you know, I send a donation today. Uh, I, I do some teaching for this other pastor in Pakistan. Actually, tomorrow will be. The kingdom's bigger than than the United States. That's that. That's the problem with that Christian nationalism that Pastor Dave is talking about. Yeah. How did we get stuck in this? Like we're the center of. We ain't the center. Yeah. We're the actually the latest comers. If you want to be chronological yeah. about and, it, you know what's uh, you know what's symptomatic of that kind of thinking. Is that when things start going bad in <laughs> politics, we say yeah. Jesus is coming back. Right. When <laughs> out of the church, we say Jesus is coming back because yeah. we're so used to thinking that whatever is happening here mm. is dictating something that God is going to do. If things start going wrong in politics, the Lord is soon to come. Things start going bad in the church, the Lord is on his way. Any second, he's going to yeah. crack the night <laughs> Because we're so used to thinking that everything revolves around uh, what's going on here. Yeah. And you've got Christians being persecuted for centuries in other places. Jesus hasn't come back yet. And, and they're still being persecuted. So till today. Know, yeah. Till, like till this real day. first century persecution, y'all. I'm talking. There's exactly. some stuff I know. 
and I, so this this is not physical, but my my guy in Pakistan. So when the relief started coming, like they don't do the stimulus check, but they the government does relief. But what they do is they prioritize the Muslim families in the country first. And by the time they get to the Christian households, there's nothing left, and they say, "Oh, we ran out." So we took it on our, our ourselves, our little house church in the West, in the United States, to support them. You, you see what I'm saying? Like the, wow. we have to, we have to. People say kingdom minded, and they don't know what that means. Kingdom minded means the kingdom wins. I like to play chess. If you like to play chess, you know that the goal is checkmate, right? The goal is not for all of your people to survive. Your pawns are going to die. You're going to lose a rook. You're going to lose a knight, a bishop, or something. But if you if you get checkmate, you win. So to be kingdom minded means I want the kingdom to win, even if I don't make it. And that's hard for us to say over here. <laughs> that's hard man, for us to say. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you can now, man. That's that. That's not going to work in that me-centric kind of culture. Uh, Sabrina Brantley is asking a really good question here. Um, how would you suggest a pastor of a multicultural church address racism, injustice, etc.? Uh, I'll just jump in real quick and say what I said yesterday. I think Act Six again is a good model, and um, and and that's not just because there is a one-to-one -one correlation between the problem between the Hellenistic Jews and the problem between the Hebraic Jews. Uh, the thing that makes that a good starting point is the way that the apostles handled it. And what they did is the Hebraic Jews, uh, I should say, um, I'm sorry, the Hellenistic Jews complained that their widows uh, were being overlooked. They complained about a problem that was impacting their community because of who they are uh, as people, because of the way that they exist in the world as Hellenistic Jewish uh, people. And, uh, and so the apostles don't um, essentially put them in the, under the third degree of interrogation how do you know? How do you know that's what's really happening to you, and uh, and and then really uh, try to get them to prove it in often the ways that uh, in conversation today about racism, people who are asking about it are really trying to get you to convince them that it actually exists, mm -hmm. and and that's not only wrong, it, it not only lacks empathy, it's doubly traumatic to the person who experiences it and their own brother and sister simply don't believe them. Well, the apostles believed the uh, Hellenistic Jews. They believed that what they said was occurring was occurring. And then they set ministry in motion in a certain way to address the disparities. Yeah. Oh, I don't believe in systematic racism and I don't believe, well, guess what? The Hellenistic Jews were experiencing um, systemic and uh, uh, systemic prejudice and uh, uh, disparities at the table of distribution. They were experiencing it. And then they, they were not made to be put through the ringer and the third degree to prove uh, how they knew it was occurring. And then they were not accused of made up things like, uh, oh, you're, you're, the, the way that you're describing that is CRT and all kinds of other dismissive things. Uh, that's how you get pastors of multicultural churches to start addressing these things, is that if you got folk in your church that's dealing with it, believe them. Believe them. They're Christians, aren't they? So they, they, so they should not be lying. They right. should not be telling, uh, uh, telling, making things up or whatever. Believe them. And if you start with believing and you start with lead off with empathy and believing, then you start actually putting into place things that work to resolve and to remedy and to provide redress to the things that the people in your congregation are experiencing. How are you going to pass the people and you don't even believe what they're telling you? What a shame. What a shame. 
Wow. You know, and, and, and some of these guys, I'm telling you, some people, what we're seeing is, is the fact that some pastors are not fit for leading because you don't even know how to, you don't know how to rightly address the needs of the people that you're pastoring, your, your, your group and your think, your, your group think uh, culture, your echo chamber and mm. silo culture is telling you to go back to your congregation and then simply play down on the experiences of a demographic in your congregation. That's not how the apostles handled it in Acts chapter six. Let's get back to the way that they did things in the Bible. And let's just start uh, leading off with love. This is a beloved community. So when people in the beloved community suffer, it should hurt all of us. Come on. Hey, <laughs> hey, Pastor played on that. Man, I, I, you know, if we just read Acts, a lot of this goes away. Not right, just right. that issue, but a lot of these... This, and I'm not sexy. And what I'm about to say, they're going to call me a Marxist now. Why? Because they're going to tack them labels on you as soon as you start talking about equality or justice. But when we look at Acts 4, they had everything in common to the point that in Acts 5, two people literally dropped dead for going mm. against the grain. Come on. You, that person who asked about the community, either you're with us or you're not. And, and to Pastor Damon's point, if you say that I'm with you and that you want me with you, at least when the offering plate come around, you do, then be with me when I got some issues going on. Now, guess what? If it was one of your issues and your echo chamber that I was bringing, oh, you'd be all over that. You'd be like, oh yeah, let me help you. Let me, let me help you go down to the abortion clinic and protest. Let me help you go to the, uh, to the, to the city hall and protest this law. But when I'm talking about something that's now going to challenge the status quo, mm -hmm. it's now going to challenge potentially you having to divest some 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 power that you didn't even recognize or realize or, or appreciate that you had. Not that I want majority culture to apologize for it. Like that's and we did a whole video on this, y'all. So I'm not going to rehash all this. We did a whole thing on Vody's fault line book and addressed a lot of these things. I was listening to something by, by uh, Brian Laritz yesterday. And he said, there's over two, I think he said 2,500 or 2,350 passages in the Bible dealing with the widow, the orphan, um, the, 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 the disenfranchised, basically those on the margins, those who need help, the, the ones in Acts 6 that Pastor Damon is talking about, these women, and if you understand first century culture, this is where the history got to come in. If you're a widow, it's not just like your husband died. That's an economic hardship that is almost impossible to overcome in that culture. That, that's just understanding the culture. So the church stepped up. If the church today, global church, especially though in this country, steps up collectively and the same fervor that you speak against abortion and homosexuality and all this other if you took that, keep that same energy, like my boy Quentin will say, right? Keep that same energy. And, and, and like you said, believe me, you know, those that know me, and this is why I think some people are silent right now. They haven't, they haven't clapped back quite hard yet. Cause you know, I'm smart. You know, you can't put me in that, that crazy, um, you know, um, black identity, you know, box, you know, I'm not that guy, you know, Pastor Damon's not that guy. So you have to engage the things we're saying on an intellectual level. Yeah. Now, if yeah. either you're going to say, well, y'all are brilliant in all these other areas, but you're just so stupid in this one. That doesn't even make logical sense. All of us are wrong. <laughs> right. All of us haven't studied. All of us don't know what systemic racism is. Like, yeah. like just uh, be Esau, honest. Dr. McCauley said, uh, you know, these types will rush past millions and millions and millions of voices saying the same thing to five five people that they agree with just because right. they look like you and then they tell you those are the same people who will turn around and say that uh you are using a color lens right well those five people that you found <laughs> to agree the fact that they happen to look like me is because it seems like you're looking through a color lens in order right. to find agreement in order to mm -hmm. uh minimize and neutralize the validity 
of the claims that are being made by the majority of folk over here. So yeah, right. it's a whole lot of, uh, I, I tell you, there, there's, there's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we and, and let's be honest, we'll be honest, we're not gonna go too much farther on this. There's stuff that I know, Damon, you deal with behind the scenes, I deal with behind the scenes, that's even deeper. And I'm not gonna blast nobody's names, I'm just saying what we're saying is true and it's truer than what we're saying. <laughs> say Here's a good biblical question uh, for you, Alex. Uh, Joshua 10, verses 10 and 11. Uh, I know I've dealt with this uh, before. Uh, be interested in your answer. Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. Did the sun, did the sun actually stand still in response to his prayer? So I... With a lot of with a lot of these kind of like this is a crazy thing type of questions, I believe the Bible, and I'll tell you why. Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. I have good reason, and I've done videos on this uh, that we have good biblical, theological, historical, archaeological reason to affirm. And actually, atheists, many atheist scholars do affirm these things as far as um, his life, his his crucifixion. The, mm -hmm. the empty tomb, although they try to say why it was empty, that I, I debunked that on Easter with that video. So I, I work backwards. If I have good reason to believe the resurrection is true, mm -hmm. and anybody in this day and age, I know you're about to do this debate, of Pastor David, but I'm going to say this. Anybody in this day and age that has ever read any kind of books on any of these topics, if you're still saying that Jesus never existed, you need to go right. sit down somewhere. Like the exactly. Bart Ehrman, one of his books here, and I've met Bart. He's a nice guy, but he's he's a he's probably the most prominent New Testament scholar, atheist, and he has he has said he snapped. There's a whole video. He snapped on some people like y'all got to stop saying that <laughs> that he that an atheist wrote a book showing that Jesus existed. Okay, so look, he, he existed. There's almost unanimous uh, like historical data that that he died by crucifixion. 75%. I had Gary Havermas on the channel a couple weeks ago, world renowned expert on this. 75% of scholars of all worldviews mm -hmm. believe the tomb is empty. So now what best explains it? Okay, so now I'm going to say just for a purpose of, of this discussion, that's a, that's a fact. That's a historical fact. Okay, mm -hmm. now we got to ask, would this man who claimed to be God, which he did, for those who don't say he didn't, be able to resurrect and if he does, what does that mean? So now we got to work backwards and look at everything he said. And one of, he, he affirmed the law. He affirmed the Old Testament. He affirmed the prophets. He said all scripture, like, this is kind of what Damon was talking about earlier, all scripture points to me. You know, now if that's not true, that's a very arrogant statement. <laughs> but it turns out it's true. So now I don't even question as much about the Old Testament. Now there's even there's I had an archae uh, uh, yeah archaeologist on my channel and he showed and he's been to places and he's found things so there's good evidence historical archaeological evidence for the flood for uh, the exodus of Egypt and so there's other things that we have good evidence for yeah and so the 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 reality is the most shocking thing in the Bible is not this passage the most the most mag magnificent miracle. I don't know it's a toss up either the incarnation or the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Those are that's kind of where I land now. Once I and then and I'll throw in there that God created ex nihilo, He created something out of nothing. Once those three are, are facts in my mind, and I and once again, I had astrophysicists on to talk about that this aligns with scientific evidence. So, so, so now I have the three hardest things to really believe established factually. So now this one becomes kind of like, hey, God, God can do anything. I don't, I don't put it past him. You know, what, now the way that I would answer that, and that's, that's a great answer, uh, by the way. Uh, the way that I would answer that is, is um, uh, I, I, I definitely believe, so I like the approach that you took is that um, when you're talking about miracles, miracles are hardly believable by nature because they don't naturally happen, Right. <laughs> Hence, it's a miracle. Right. It's a divine intervention uh, into the normal course of nature uh, that is um, highly improbable. Like the chances of that occurring 
is highly improbable. And uh, and so uh, the Red Sea yeah. opening up, standing up tall and people being able to like on both sides, literally parting. That would be miraculous. That is very difficult to believe yeah. because it just doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. So it is with this. Uh, but I also believe that when we're reading the Old Testament, it's not that we need to, uh, as um, the German theologian Rudolf Boltman uh, mm -hmm. suggested, that we need to demythologize scripture, pull the miracles out of it. Right. Uh, but sometimes even the miracles need to be nuanced. Uh, like, for instance, in, in, in my interpretation of this, a miracle occurred. Most likely the miracle that occurred was not what Joshua thought occurred. Joshua was mm -hmm. describing the miracle in phenomenological terms. In other words, how it appeared to him doesn't mean that how it appeared is what really happened. Right. So he's not lying about what happened. He's just describing it in phenomenological terms, not scientific. This is right. what it looked like to me. The sun stood still. Now, whether that happened or not is really not the issue. The real question is, did a miracle occur here? Yeah. Something did occur, something that was miraculous that science probably doesn't have the answer to. Right. I would probably bet that it wasn't the sun standing still only because science tells us that the earth not only spins on an axis, mm -hmm. but it also revolves around the sun. So the sun's not really moving anyway. Right. The earth is. Now, that would leave us with the whole notion of, well, did the earth stop moving mm. in its rotation around mm. the sun? That is possible. I know scientists would start talking about centrifugal force or whatever. At the end of the day, the sun doesn't move anyway. So the sun didn't stand still because the sun ain't really moving. Right. <laughs> so 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 Josh was talking about really what he what it looks like happened. At the end of the day, something miraculous did occur mm -hmm. that gave Joshua and his army more time to fight. How God actually did that is a mystery. Yeah. Based on science, we can probably rule the sun standing still out, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we get to rule out uh, the supernatural in the phenomenon right. because at the end of the day, a miracle did occur, whether we can explain it or not. And so, so I'm kind of with the both and piece is, is that sometimes we've got to understand their phenomena. Like for, for them, the earth was flat. Right. That was their phenomenological perspective. Scientifically, they were wrong, but they spoke about a flat disk being held up by pillars on each end. That's really not the way the earth is, but that's how they perceived the yeah. earth to be. And they wrote with that kind of thinking in mind. And so we got to be careful to separate in a sense in from an exegetical standpoint the redemptive spiritual data yeah from the phenomenological perspective and nuances of the writers every work of the writer is not necessarily god putting his stamp on it yeah it's god working his message through their quirkiness mm -hmm. and their nuances of thinking God still inspiring them even through uh warped perspectives yeah or or perspectives that are not necessarily scientifically accurate yet God's message is still working getting through all of their uh yeah. um deficiencies or whatever inadequacies and all of that does, does that make sense no I think that's really good too and I was I was actually thinking because I had there was a I'm trying to Trying to remember the passage. It's one of the, some other weird passages, and, and I get this question a lot. But basically, we got to remember, as you said, people are writing from their perspective. In other words, they don't have a bird's eye view that God has. So you're you're seeing 
from your eyes outward. And there's another thing we got to remember. There is a quality to ancient Near East writings. And so when you study other writings of that time era, right. hyperbole was, was on 10. I mean, so a lot of times, you know, I get the question about what about the killing of the Canaanites, right? That's always the one they want to stump you with because God's evil, right? Well, the uh, wipe them all out language, it was hyperbole. And how do we know? Because in the very next chapter, when they wipe them all out, he God says, don't intermarry with them. Well, who are you going to marry with if they all did? There so, you go. So it wasn't an actual literal wipe, kill everything. Although, but see, we're reading it with Western eyes. That's actually a good book. Misreading scripture with through Western eyes. We're right. reading it as when I read those words from my context, it means this thing. But that's mm -hmm. not necessarily what they meant. And we know it's not what they meant because we could see it in the very next chapter and we could see it in, in, in Chronicles and other, other places where it wasn't um, Canaanites that were already there weren't barred. If they wanted to submit to the uh, God of Israel, they could do that. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of a sidebar. But, yeah, you definitely got to catch the hyperbole sometimes, catch the perspective of, of who's writing it. That's good. Pastor, we got 10 minutes. All right. Uh, I'm going to try and do a. We 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 will give we'll try and give 20 to 30 second answers to the remaining questions to get them all out. All right. Uh, but let's let's go ahead. Um Lil uh, Lily T asking about vaccines. Well, uh accuse you of not being Christ like because you refuse to take listen, you know if you're Christ like or not. Um this vex this this whole debacle. <laughs> And uh, Damon and I were talking about this the other day. It's gotten so far from what it should. Like, this is a health issue. It's not a political issue. It became political, regardless of what side of the aisle you might be on. It became political. And some people wanted to keep it and want to keep it political. I don't think it, it should ever be. If there used to be this time where Democrats, Republicans on health issues, we disagreed. And then we go back to fighting later about taxes or whatever. I want to get back to that. <laughs> yeah. So take it if you think, it, you know, don't if you don't. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Now, I would caution Christians against pushing conspiracy theory yes. uh, because that weakens your witness. Um, mm -hmm. Let the world be the conspiracy theorist. Get out of the conspiracy theory bit uh, business. That's not for us. Uh, that that actually undermines the gospel in reality. Christians should ought not be. Uh, and that's not to say that they're not legit conspiracies out there, but nine times out of 10, a conspiracy theory is just that a theory. Uh, and it, and it kind of ends up undermining your, your, your witness and the gospel even, uh, because it puts you in, uh, uh, it literally puts you in alignment and in agreement with, uh, weirdos and wackos. You know what I mean? You just want to be careful about that. And, um, uh, there's a lot of things that folk are not getting polio, uh, then, you know, the black plague, this, that, and the other. You want to know why folk ain't getting that? Because of vaccines. Right. So why <laughs> would the mark of the beast then when like your children don't have to worry about the black plague and yeah. about polio? Uh, but when, when, when my grandmother was coming along, uh, kids were literally getting crippled because of polio, mm -hmm. like never being able to walk again because of polio and, and, and vaccines, took care of that. Uh, the, the Spanish flu from 1918 to 1920, yep. they developed a vaccine. The Spanish flu never came back again. Right. So we ought not be thinking, trying to be theological about this is medical. This is a health issue. Right. It's not political and it's not theological. But at the end of the day, you decide whether you want to get it. I just got the first one of mine yesterday, ironically. Yep. See what I mean? So, Me too. hey, uh, you do what you think is best for you, but don't be getting on there spreading conspiracy theory because because yeah. that's not Christ like because you could be playing with somebody's health. You right. could because you're so careless with your your dealing of it. You could literally convince somebody to do something that is really in the best interest of their health, convince them not to do it all because you felt like being irresponsible about what you think about this side or the other. Uh, that's what I would say about that. And uh, next question. 
They maintain faith in God that doesn't seem to care about 400 years of black suffering. Okay. So look, the man, this is one of the men right here who just uh, helped write the Urban Apologetics book. So I'm letting <laughs> him get the last word on this. But get the book. Here, here, here's here's the fundamental issue. I'm my, the name of my um my my apologetic ministry is proof for the truth. The foundation is truth. What's true? I, once I know what's true, I'll work from there and I'll deal with the existential, the 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 moral, the ethical issues that that I might struggle with. But if one plus one is two, one plus one is two. That is what it is. So so I say that to say this: Is there good evidence to believe God exists? Is there good evidence to, to know that Christianity was in Africa long before Europe? Absolutely. On both of those things. Um, is there, I mean, there's Africans in the Bible. So anyway, is there a good reason to believe that the character, the nature and the standards of God are what we believe them to be as far as his omnibenevolence? I think there is good reason to believe that based on the scripture, based on other things. Okay. So now in the lived reality, the issues I have. Here's the reality, specifically in the Western context, part of it at least. We don't have time to do the whole 400-year history, but people send. The, the way the moral argument goes is this. If there is a moral law that necessitates a moral lawgiver, if, if evil does exist, which this was evil, even though some people want to gloss over that, like Rick Santorum, oops, uh, yeah. <laughs> If evil does exist, 400 years of slavery was absolute evil. But if that if that's objectively true, then it's also objectively true that objective good exists. If objective good exists, you have to have a moral law on the basis to which to differentiate. That says there's a moral law giver, and that's God. The problem is, in the lived reality, some Christians in this country even, we go to George Whitfield, Jonathan Edward, considered the, the greatest pastor of their time. George, George Whitfield advocated for Georgia to... to uh, adopt slavery as a pastor that's sinful and we as a country and this is what we mean when we say justice when we we're saying you have to even though you didn't do it you have to you america has to apologize and recognize that you were not just um not just that it happened you were complicit in it the christian church in this country has to acknowledge their complicity but god didn't do it and and we have and I know it's hard, but we have to be able to separate the two, because if God takes away or if God stopped that and He takes away our free will in those moments, then when does it stop? It's a slippery slope. And somebody said, "Well, why didn't He stop at one hundred? Why?" If He does that, He can't undo that in anyone's life ever again, in any and in, in, in perpetuity. And so. To un there's you know look I got a whole shelf just on moral argument. <laughs> there is so many nuances here, and this is this is, gets to be a pastoral question. It gets to be um, a personal thing, and I get that. And, and I and I, we you know if you want to hit me offline, we can talk about it. But I say what's true, and then now let me deal with my issues and and start there. Good deal, good deal. We're down to um, the final uh, two. I see a couple of battleground questions. And uh, we, we we put out some rules at the beginning that <laughs> the answer causes you to land on one side or the other. Uh, this, you know, this wouldn't be the right form here. Let me just say this, because I just noticed the date and um, 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 April 29th, 1990, I preached my first sermon uh, all right. years ago today. It happened to land on a Sunday. Wow. April 29th, 1990, my first sermon, 31 years ago today. And yeah, yeah. So this is kind of like a ministry anniversary uh, for me. And I just happened to be looking at the date and I'm like, April 29th, that date sounds familiar. <laughs> it's a ministry anniversary for me. And uh, I applaud and your longevity, sir. That's, that's a tough thing nowadays. I got a few little uh, raise a kind of you know, little wisdom, little wisdom there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what better place to celebrate it than with uh, with all of you doing doing ministry, amen? Doing ministry, and um, uh, real oh, yes, indeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, two last questions, uh, 
there we go. We got to hit it real quick. One last one. Uh, here we go. And boom. Pastor, what do you think, man? I'm going to let you handle that. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you know, hear me, hear me out and hear me well. Uh, again, what, one of the things that people do is they um, they tend to think emotionally and rate and and uh, relationally about answers. Uh, if you think about truth emotionally and relationally, then there's going to be some truth that you will like, and there will be some truth you won't like. Mm-hmm. But that's not how we deal with truth. Right. And the problem with this question right here is, is that everybody is going to know a pastor that is a Freemason, mm. which means that my answer will be like saying, you mean you mean you trying to say that my pastor is wrong? Mm. You mean you trying to say and that would be hearing the answer the wrong way, mm. because at the end of the day, truth doesn't have anything specifically to do with your granddad your grandma or your pastor, truth is truth universally, regardless of who, right? So so in reality, the reason that Freemasonry would be wrong, and there are many Christians who subscribe to it, but I'm still going to go on record saying Freemasonry is wrong for several reasons. Mm-hmm. Number one, uh, it is um, directly uh, literally directly opposed to what we see in scripture. Uh, it has, according to its own Masonic scholars, uh, a God that it, that, that it worships, uh, that is a composite deity of several Canaanitic deities, including Yahweh that they call Baphomet. That's essentially, um, that's essentially, uh, idolatry, polytheism, uh, at the very least. Uh, number two, there are places of worship. Those places of worship are not congregations. They are secret societies. Yeah. Uh, and so people are linked together uh, by the rituals, the myths, and the secrets they hold, not by brotherhood in Christ. So it's places of worship are in direct opposition with scripture. It also not only has uh, places of worship, a God of adoration and superstition, but it also has rituals of worship that are very different. For instance, Masons are buried in an apron. That apron is essentially called an apron of righteousness that according to Masonic teaching represents you uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, that is in conflict with the gospel. Christ is our mediator between God and men. It is the righteousness of Christ that is uh, that that is uh, that is uh, credited to us by faith when we believe. No, no apron with occultic symbols is going to be uh, efficacious enough to represent us uh, before. Uh, the throne of God. You understand what I'm saying? So there's all kinds of problems uh, there. Uh, lastly, the very first ritual to even of the very first degree, a poor blind man in search of light denies knowing Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Because darkness in scripture is symbolized uh, as sinful, as being ignorant of the truth. Light as Jesus talked about it, is knowing God, therefore knowing truth. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. How does a Christian justify uh, having Jesus, therefore having light, yet claiming to be in darkness and hoping that the rituals and the teachings of the Uh, Masonic Lodge are going to give you light. That is not only denying that Jesus is the light, but it is also accrediting to Freemasonry uh, having truth greater than the person and the work of Jesus. There's just no, and it doesn't matter who, what bishop, this, that, and the other. When we look at it objectively from that standpoint, and there's a lot of other things that I could get into, um, no Christian really ought to be dealing with it. No Christian ought to be considering themselves a Freemason. They ought to abandon it because it is 
uh, in direct opposition and conflict uh, with what we read about in scripture. There's a lot of other things I could get into. Yeah. Uh, we are four minutes over and yeah. uh, but I, I wanted to kind of, since that was the last question, uh, you know, take a little time to kind of uh, mention That's good. My opinion on that, as opposed to just giving you some, uh, you know, some, some, some emotional rant uh, that didn't really help you process where's the wrong in it. Right. Yeah. So those are some things that you could, Go ahead, Pastor. And I, I I have very quick. Why? Like my my what's your motivation? That's that's my only question. Same thing when I've I've talked a lot about this mysticism, crystals and sage. And if once you say Jesus and that's a you, that's a bad sentence. <laughs> so if Jesus isn't enough, why not? That's my only question to anybody. Like may, we can put every anything in that category. If you need something other than Jesus, then you don't understand Jesus. So Absolutely. Hit me up at Damon.Richardson at FaithLife.com uh, if you're interested in getting a Largos library. I'm literally at a conference right now. I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina right now at a conference, did a webinar uh, just before we jumped on tonight, and then I'm presenting in the morning. So I've got some really, really great deals that I can get you in under some significant deep discounts on any Lagos library, but you got to get with me. Email me, give me your number. I'll reach back out to you tomorrow and we can get you uh, under a payment plan. We need to get you studying. We need to get everybody digging into Please. the work of God. Thanks so much, D Proverbs, for that super chat. Everybody give it up for my man, my bro, Pastor <laughs> McElroy. <laughs> I wish I had the clap this man. This man. <laughs> I wish I had the clap track for you, but I, <laughs> I really appreciate uh this so much. Uh look at Richly Redeems like, man, we need this format at least uh once a month. But I really appreciate yeah. you again for coming on this platform and yes, just sharing your wealth of wisdom and knowledge, your experiences uh with us. And and uh man, check my brother out. Uh, again, there's his blog. Uh, there is his YouTube channel. Subscribe, Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. Do the very same thing that you do here. Like, share, subscribe, and hit Man. that notification bell. Appreciate you. Brother, I really appreciate you. Thank you, you again, too. all of you who hung in there with us tonight. I had no idea that tonight was the NFL draft. I didn't and either. <laughs> so for you that had to... Uh, make a difficult choice, and you came <laughs> over here. There is a reward for you awaiting. <laughs> God is going to <laughs> indeed. For, I tell you, the uh, eternal charities that go on <laughs> with uh, choosing the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you for <laughs> with us. Blessings to you all. Amen. And uh, no hoop triggers. I let my I let my subscription <laughs> expire. So I got. <laughs> in for at least another 14 days and uh who knows i'll be back uh maybe the next time uh with uh some more b uh b flat or e flat and uh, maybe we'll get uh alex to do a little hooping for us the next time nope. <laughs> <laughs> please to you all thanks again and uh who's this I, now i don't know if that i got a brother-in-law named willie washington not sure if that's him uh or not but uh, regardless, thanks, Willie, for joining us. Blessings, peace, love, and uh, blessings to all of you in Jesus' name.